Okay, I'm going to start. I'm actually a few minutes over, but that's fine. We'll catch up. So my name is uh, Peter Zemek, uh, PhD from Rutgers University, been source testing for 35 years. I've tested volcanoes uh, throughout the world and done research and ambient air monitoring and test programs in 23 countries around the world. Um, today we're going to talk about a technology that was put together by a company called FluxSense. And FluxSense is a company out of Sweden that essentially uh, is a mobile platform. And uh, right now, South Coast AQMD has two of those vehicles and Colorado uh, uh, environmental um, uh, equivalent environmental services uh, uh, regulatory uh, has just purchased another one. Um, their preliminary results show that there are uh, emissions that are four to ten times higher than the published emission factors for alkanes and uh, uh, also for NO, NO2 and SO2. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, that made a lot of refineries nervous. So the refineries put together this, uh, what we call, quote unquote, experts team, right? Uh, made up of my, uh, some of my colleagues here, um, some very, very uh, uh, smart people that, um, you know, I'm just amazed by. Um, but uh, we're all kind of atmospheric chemists and we did a, review of the flux sense te technology and about five of their emissions and measurement reports uh, over the years 2007 to 2014. Uh, they have just released a new um, paper uh, as of last month and those that review is also included in this revised presentation. But so the flux sense platform is essentially a mobile platform that contains various different technologies that are then uh, uh, results from those different technologies are taken uh, bits and pieces from. Uh, they're plugged into a model and that model is then uh, generates emission factors and those emission factors are being used by regulatory agencies to look at whether or not uh, refineries are over reporting or under reporting their emissions. Uh, what the general consensus is right now is uh, that the flux sense is showing emissions that are four to ten times higher than the published emission factors. So obviously refineries want to look into this and find out what's going on. And so we're going to discuss some of those findings here. Um, the platform consists of uh, essentially two main technologies. You have what's called extractive FTIR and you have uh, solar occultation uh, FTIR, which is essentially an infrared technique. Uh, one uses the sun as a source of infrared energy. The other is an enclosed uh, cell um, that's open to the atmosphere and has a fixed path length. The other is uh, ultraviolet um, differential optical absorption spectroscopy, otherwise known as UV DOAS, it's an ionizing radiation. And again, it uses um, both a ground level um, fixed path length and the other one actually uses a column measurement which uses stray ultraviolet light from the sun to measure a column of air from the ground or wherever it's deployed up into the stratosphere. All right, we're going to talk about those technologies. All right, these are the essential um, emission factors for refineries for alkanes, NOx and SO2. And here you can see the orange bars or the orange squares represent the published emission factors that have been used by refineries uh, over the last several decades. And uh, the blue bars represent, the blue boxes represent the new emissions that are calculated using the flux sense technology. So here for alkanes, you can see we're about almost six times higher than published emission factors. So the question is why? Why is flux sense reading so much higher than the published emission factors that are primarily based upon empirical measurements um, of direct measurements of particular compounds. Uh, on the bottom two graphs, you represent NOx and SO2, which NOx is a little lower than published emission factors and SO2 is one and a half times. So people are not really questioning the NOx and SO2, but they are questioning the alkanes. Okay, now why are refineries nervous? Refineries are nervous because um, if you have four to 10 times higher emissions uh, than you actually thought you had, uh, this might put you into what's called uh, Title V 
uh, major source classification. And if that happens, which means that you have emissions of over 10 tons per year of one particular hazardous air pollutant or 25 tons per year of combined hazardous air pollutants, you become classified as a major source of emissions. And that changes the whole regulatory outlook for your, for your organization. Um, where it means uh, lots and lots of more testing and lots and lots of more record keeping and reporting. All right, it also means that uh, you open yourselves up to a lot of negligence um, and lawsuits by community groups and others, um, other receptors around the facilities. Um, now, I do want to mention that in Europe, this technology has been accepted, at least in its draft form right now, and a new environmental um, European uh, standard has been published in draft form known as CEM 17628 which was actually um, just released in April of 2022, right? And the title is Fugitive Diff Diff Diffuse Emissions of Common Concern to Industry Sectors and its Standard Methods to Determine Diffuse Emissions of Volatile Organic Compounds into the Atmosphere. This is essentially a guidebook that tells you how to use this technology to, um, to reduce your uncertainty uh, down to levels that would be acceptable by regulatory authority. Now, what that means is a can of worms, because just because you're looking at uncertainty does not mean you're actually um, looking at the bias from the measurement. Uncertainty and bias are two different things, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So the questions that were, that were asked by the panel, the experts panel, was what is the total random error for this methodology, and whether that or not that error can be measured or whether it could be modeled well and that of course means whether it's a gaussian distribution or whether it's a skewed uncertainty um, or bias and uh, uh, again when we talk about bias versus uncertainty um, uncertainty is essentially you can think of as the error associated with generating a theoretical concentration or measurement um, and that uncertainty is measured by a bunch of different things. In other words, the uh, the accuracy and the precision of the measurement method that goes into the uncertainty. And the uncertainty can generally be described as a square root of the sum of the squares of the errors. Right? When you look about when you talk about bias, bias is is a little more difficult. Um, in that bias can be hidden, meaning that. Um, Say you get a cylinder, you order a cylinder from a vendor that says plus or minus 5%, and uh, you measure that cylinder later after you use it, and you find out that it's actually off by 30%. So the uncertainty is plus or minus 2% because that's a measurement, but there is a systematic bias in, in that cylinder, and that systematic bias will translate through the entire um, calculation process, especially when you're using a model. And we're going to discuss some of these things. So we wanted to try to determine whether or not the uncertainty was larger than the bias or whether there's a hidden bias that's causing these emissions to be uh, reported that are that are higher than published emission factors. All right, we talked a little bit about bias on uncertainty, and there's several different types of uncertainty. I'm not going to go into that because we'll get into the weeds. Um, but again, we talked about the bias where, you know, you can think of it as an erroneous cylinder concentration that's above and beyond the actual published uncertainty in the analysis of that cylinder. All right, or it could be that a you put HF in an aluminum cylinder and you come back two weeks later and there's no HF in that cylinder, yet you assume there is, well, that's a bias that's not an uncertainty. All right, so when we were talking about the flux sense data discussion, and I'll, it, it's a little complicated in terms of the model that they're using. They're using uh, wind velocities, they're using wind directions. They're calculating the uh, distribution of wind velocities in a column measurement from up to about 40 meters high. Um, they're making a lot of assumptions. Some of those assumptions are that the plume that they're measuring is homogeneous throughout the entire path length or that the plume is in maybe in fact um, might be a, a smaller plume with a higher concentration. And when you're using a path integrated concentration measurement, which assumes a homogeneity, homogeneous concentration throughout the entire path length, uh, you can run into problems. That's some of the issues that we're going to address. Some of the other issues that, that we came up with were um, whether or not a complex 
terrain near multiple sources um, can give you an accurate cross section of the atmosphere. In other words, in Southern California, there are refineries next to airports, next to major highways, next to other refineries, next to wastewater treatment plants. All right, they're all along each other's fence lines. And so you have a very complicated plume uh, geometries that are crossing over and mixing. And uh, you're also near a Bay Area um, where the wind changes throughout the day. All right, so it comes in in the morning off of the ocean and then uh, tends to head out to sea in the afternoon. And this has been measured many, many times empirically. Yet um, Fluxense is assuming that this is a homogeneous plume with a constant velocity throughout the entire measurement. When you measure um, constant uh, velocities, which goes directly into the flux concentration as a direct multiplier, um, this is really a major source of error. Um, and we'll talk about whether or not this is this is measured correctly or not. And there's a little discrepancy in that flux sense makes a claim of being homogeneous in one in in one report, yet not being homogeneous in in another report. And uh, you, you can't have it both ways, all right? So um, the panel concerns was what the entire plume captured, all right? Um, is the cross-sectional wind velocity correct? In other words, is it a homogeneous plume, or do you have a plume? that's crossing over your field of view that is say 15 meters in diameter. How do you measure that diameter? All right, that's one of the issues that we've asked. Are you assuming homogeneous throughout the entire column or are you in fact applying a diameter to the cross sectional area of the plume? All right, and um, upwind and downwind parcels of air. If you don't measure them simultaneously, it is very difficult to actually uh, assume that it's constant upstream and downstream from the actual facility itself, right? Because you are taking uh, X readings in time one, and then you're going and taking X readings in time two, and unless they're done simultaneously, is another source, major source of error. Okay, this technology that FluxSense is using is actually, uh, can only be measured and used about four hours per day under ideal meteorological conditions. In other words, four hours per day during uh, when the sun is in its proper zenith for the UV measurements and is actually um, can be tracked readily across the sky in the solar occultation flux measurements. Right, unless that is done, um, unless there's a difference between perfectly sunny days with blue skies where the wind is five to seven meters per second uh, in the daylight, or whether or not things are different at nighttime, in the winter, in the spring, um, during uh, rush hour, and other variables that are difficult to track and measure. All right, so only use four hours per day during ideal meteorological conditions. So that is a problem straight off the off the bat because we're looking at there's greater than 60% of the data is actually missing. So you're assuming an emission factor based upon 40% um, of actual empirical data provided and only during daylight hours. Okay, this is a study that showed that single daytime four hour experiments um, may not represent annual average emissions. And so a few daytime snapshots of emissions um, is difficult to extrapolate to annualized emissions. In other words, and if you want to use this technology, you have to go out there and measure it multiple days, many, many, many days during um, different seasons of the year, right? Because obviously refineries change their fuel blends in, in throughout seasonal. Obviously in the winter, you know, you're adding ethanol or other components to the gas, and this will affect your emissions. Um, this is not addressed anywhere in any of their reports other than to say that they uh, quoted a few reports of refineries that show that there is no seasonal variation between emissions and that just doesn't make sense to us. So uh, that that's a, a big issue and a red flag for us. Um, all right, so again, I talked about you have to measure many, many, many times throughout the year in order to reduce the uncertainty of this deterministic model, right? Which means you're using a model and not real time empirical measurements. Um, and then you're plugging them into the model and the model spitting out the answer but there's a lot of uncertainty and we think a lot of bias in the measurement. All right, so um, FluxSense 
makes these assumptions. They're assuming that it's a well mixed plume with no overlaps. We already know that this is not the state, uh, not the uh, not reality. They do quote an indirect uh, emission measurement from a tank farm using the EPA tanks data uh, model, and they're comparing the emissions from the tanks model to some empirical measurements they made along a tank farm, which will, they did the measurements very close to the tank farm. Well, this is an ideal um, measurement condition. Um, it's a very simple model. You're, you're only looking at uh, a simple terrain with uh, a series of tanks and uh, under ideal meteorological conditions of wind velocities during uh, very calm periods of the day. And they make the assumptions that, well, it's a well mixed plume and there is no overlap. Right? Then they are taking the emissions of BTEX by stating that the concentration of the BTEX from the ground level DOAS instrument divided by the concentration of the alkane measurement from the ground level measurement multiplied by the emissions of the alkane by the solar occultation flux, right, is equal to your emissions BTEX. Um, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, in order for that to be representative, it has to be done over and over and over and over again, all right, to reduce the uncertainty, because there's a lot of uncertainty, and I'll show you what I'm talking about in terms of uncertainty. Now, they also claim that um, overlapping plumes and different seasonal variations do not affect emissions from uh, refineries. And here is an example from some papers where South Coast Air Quality Management District actually did measurements of various distances from the I-710 freeway. And you can see during the winter and summer months, there are discrepancies between the actual emissions. All right, so this could be a seasonal bias that was not accounted for in the calculations of the model. Now, Fluxense um, estimates, um, Oh, I'm sorry, this should be flux sense. The, the experts panel estimated 30 to 50% errors. All right, now they just presented a paper last month and in that they claimed 20 to 70% uncertainty. Now that's a lot of uncertainty, but that still doesn't explain how you can be say six times higher than the emissions factors. Even if you assume the, the worst uncertainty 70%, that's only a two fold difference. Doesn't, doesn't answer why it's six fold difference. All right, so that's why when we talk about uncertainty and bias, we have to be careful. We think that somewhere hidden in these measurements is a bias that's not being accounted for. All right, and so we have to dig a little bit deeper and we have to see what the Europeans actually are going to come up with now that they've accepted this draft method. And when they start publishing data, we'll be looking at that data and looking for those systematic biases that are unaccounted for presently. All right, now. Refiners aren't refuting that they might be higher than emission factors. They might be two times higher. They might be even three times higher, but four to 10 times higher. That's just a red flag that that uh, that just screams more testing and and uh, orthogonal types of testing. In other words, other types of more absolute measurements such as say proton transfer reaction time of flight mass spectrometry, uh, which can give you empirical numbers. Uh, in real time that are absolute in time and space, right? Other than deterministic models that use models plugging in a bunch of different variables. Right? The second major source of uh, bias that we think might be going on is wind field magnitude and spatial variability in the neighborhoods, right? Um, previous papers did not use LIDAR and SON technology. They used a bunch of meteorological stations, right? They go to 10 meters in height. We're trying to figure out whether concentrations of pollutants are mixed homogeneously up to 40 meters high. All right, a 10 meter station is not going to do that. Their latest papers are using LIDAR and SON technology, which is much better. And, and everyone's in agreement that that's the way it should be done. LIDAR is really the technology of the future for doing wind velocities at various heights in three dimensions. And uh, so that's going to improve the measurements and we'll see what happens. The second source of error is the uh, is the plume homogeneous? And then how do you calculate the cross-sectional area? And that little picture there, that if you see a plume moving across a field, all right, and you can actually visualize it, right, because there's particulate in there or, so, or steam vapor or something, you can estimate the cross-sectional diameter of that plume, or you can use LIDAR and actually measure it. 
right? They're assuming that it's homogeneously mixed up to 40 meters high from ground level to 40 meters. And they contradict themselves. Um, you, you can't have it both ways. You can either assume homogeneity and demonstrate that, or you can find a plume and find that cross-sectional area. Um, when you do volcano measurements, it's very easy because you can see the plume. It's, it's, it's huge, right? But it's crossing overhead, and then you can move out of the plume and move into the plume, and then you have your differentials, right? That's much easier to do. Uh, when you're looking at refineries, that plumes are the farther away they are from the refinery, the more mixing, the more dispersion goes on, and it becomes much more difficult to measure. All right, you also then have to do simultaneous measurements upwind and downwind from the facility because I'm telling you within an hour in the Southern California Basin, it can change 20 to 30 percent easily. All right, another systematic bias. The other is impact of solar occultation flux spectral interference due to the variability of, say, water vapor uh, with these empirical measurements. Now, when you're using ultraviolet, not ultraviolet, uh, mid-infrared measurements, which is what the FTIRs actually do, that they're using, water is your main interference. And it's ubiquitous, cosmopolitan throughout the entire um, spectrum, and it interferes in every measurement you actually do. Now, there are very good ways to subtract that out, but none of that data is ever um, uh, conjoined with the actual papers that are that are published or presented. So how those spectral interferences are treated is very important. Another source of uncertainty and possible systematic bias. Now, what is interesting is that we did find a bunch of sources of uncertainty and possible bias. However, most 90% of these sources of uncertainty and bias would in fact tend to bias the emissions lower, right? So this is going in the wrong direction, which is very confusing because by all um, means, this should be lowering the emissions when in fact they're still four to 10 times higher than published emission factors. Uh, I'm not gonna run through these really quickly, but you know they're there, the paper's here, if anyone wants to look at it in detail. But these are more negative biases, all right? Um, everything from linearity checks on mid-IR detectors that have inherently unlinear, unlinear characteristics, nonlinear characteristics. Uh, the use of glass in their white cells, um, and how does that affect different measurements such as formaldehyde and other types of alkanes um, and carbonyls. And how those uh, spectrally treated. Uh, if you look in that bottom right hand, you see an overlap of a bunch of alkanes, which are bit basically just carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, right? Carbon, hydrogen stretch occurs in this 2900 region of the spectrum. They're all overlapped on each other, and it becomes very difficult to chemometrically pull that out. People have been working on that for 20 years, and they have, in fact, come up now with a process that reduces this to about plus or minus 10%. So still doesn't answer the source of our issues, and it's going in the wrong direction. All right, so um, flux sense assumed that ground level concentrations to measure plume heights after the LIDAR was employed were uniform from the ground to the maximum plume height, which was assumed to be 40 meters, All right? Um, and we talked about how they come up with the actual BTEX measurements, um, which is a little shaky. Um, and then in another paper, they say you can actually calculate the cross-sectional area of the plume. Um, we think that this is really one of the major sources of the error, um, that they are not homogeneous. And I'll show you in the next slide what, that, what I mean by that. Um, and the UV was only performed in selected zones where um, the zenith angle was perfect so that you didn't have stray UV light getting into the instrument and biasing the numbers. Right. Also with the solar occultation flux, using the sun as a source of energy is very difficult because the sun is constantly moving and there's stray light from things bouncing off of objects and, and particulates and other things that when they're engulfed by the instrument um, causes problems with the background measurement. If you have problems with the background measurement, you're going to have problems with the reported concentrations, right? Um, 
So during the ideal measurement window, which is four hours, we think that there are problems, all right? Um, that there something's going on. Maybe there's more emissions at night. Uh, maybe there's more emissions during uh, summer hours where ambient temperatures are higher, so you're going to get more volatilization. And you can't make a claim that winter and summer are different. There's there's no difference between the emissions between these. It just doesn't make sense. Now, when we talk about the plume geometries, um, again, uh, depending on what's in the plume, the temperature of the plume, the height that that plume was released, it's going to affect where that plume travels and what the dispersion characteristics of that plume are. And you can see in this on the left here, um, sometimes a plume might loft and you all see a smokestack when you're driving by and you know it's just lofting around. All right, that's ideal meteorological conditions. You can get a cross-sectional area of that. But sometimes if the wind is, is high, you know, that plume is folding over itself. Sometimes it's diving towards the ground. And then also the compounds that make up that plume have different densities, right? And they have different polar, um, uh, different uh, solubilities, for lack of a better word, which means that they could be more polar or less polar, which means they're going to associate with, with moisture in the air. Some of them are going to stay aloft. Some of them are going to take a dive to the ground. Some of them are going to form drops and fall out and condense. All right, so without knowing what's in the plume um, also becomes very difficult. Um, so Fluxense is assuming, again, this homogeneous mixing of the plume, and we just don't feel that that is a representative measurement um, to be plugged into the model. And that is one of the major sources of bias here. And in here's the Fluxense claim that up to, they cite one paper that shows that the plume was well mixed up to 250 meters in height. Well, sure, that, that can happen during certain meteorological conditions or in certain geographic locations, maybe over a very flat terrain. But when you have a very complex terrain with multiple plumes um, and the wind coming off of the ocean uh, and throughout different parts of the day, you can't assume one velocity and you can't assume homogeneity, All right? So, but if you look at the uncertainties in the wind height profile, Uncertainty is only 10 to 20 percent error. So again, this doesn't exactly explain, you know, how this can make four to ten times higher emissions. However, that again, we talked about uncertainty versus bias, and this doesn't mean that the bias doesn't have a solar bias, doesn't have a seasonal bias, doesn't have a proximity to near road sources bias, and several other parameters that that I won't go into, but those are the major ones. All right, so, and why do we say this? Well, here's some actual empirical data from wind measurements in the Long Beach, California area. And you can see that this is really just one day of measurements. The wind is changing direction. It's changing its intensity. Um, it's coming in during one part of the day, going out on other parts of the day. That's gonna determine that's going to change where you're doing your measurements. Are you miss, missing part of the plume? Are you missing the background part of the plume? Is it coming from some other source and being contributed to one refinery when it's not coming from that refinery? It's coming from a different refinery or some other source, right? Those are not answered in the model. And that's the source of bias that we're trying to figure out. Uh, here's another one where wind speeds and directions in the air are variable in space and time. And even over these very short distances, you can see these wind roses here. Some of them are pointing in uh, different directions with different magnitudes. Right, so that's a problem. All right, so we feel that the representativeness of the data um, when it's limited to four hours during optimal meteorological conditions and during the day does not represent the true emissions from a refinery throughout the entire annualized year, All right? And the wind velocities were not direct, but indirect, All right? They weren't directly measured. They were uh, assumed and they were used from certain meteorological stations and plugged into the model. Whereas I, we really feel that you need multiple LIDAR technologies uh, at all four corners, and there needs to be an integrated calculation process that uses those very small parcels of wind velocities and directions to come up with a, an integrated calculation 
for the emissions because the wind speed is directly multiplied by the concentration of the pollutants to come up with the flux measurements. And that's how flux is generated. Concentration times wind speed equals flux, mass per time through a cross-sectional area. So this is the actual model that FluxSense uses. And you can see that slant column densities for the species is very important. Um, but you can see here's that that average wind speed at plume height is a, a direct multiplier and that is uh we feel that is really one of the major sources of the error uh, or bias that's going on it doesn't mean this technology can't be used and and what they've done is is really interesting work i mean they've really done a lot of work and these are not inexpensive vans these are on the order of two million dollars a piece all right um yet we feel that uh they just need to take a more method methodical approach to the actual measurements, slow down and do it again over multiple, multiple, multiple days and times right? in order to come up with that either average wind speed or an integrated wind speed that you take slices and then you integrate the concentration and the flux. All right, and then the model also falls apart if there's no wind and this happens. Wind dies down, you still have emissions, but you have zero flux. Well, that can't be true. You can't have zero flux if there's no wind. You still get dispersion. It still crosses the the uh, the fence line. Um, so it, that's a problem with the model. All right. So you know there needs to be um, when there is no wind speed. What what happens with those flux measurements? Are they being added into? And that could also be a source of the bias that when the wind is not there, that they're not added, they're not subtracting those emissions from the emission factors. That could be it too. We're, we're not sure there needs to be more work that needs to be done. All right, now the European um, method, and uh, well, that's a 930, all right, look at. Um, now they understand this too. If you read that document, they understand there's a lot of uncertainty. There could be some bias. And so their answer to this is to, uh, they've claimed that, well, they look at it and they say there's 20 to 40% uncertainty. Again, they never address the bias, they just address the uncertainty. But they say, well, we can reduce the uncertainty, the random uncertainty by doing multiple observations per day and source, right? And you have to do at least three different measurement days per source, right? We feel this is on the low side. This should really be bumped up needs to be like at least two weeks to a month worth of, of test days that need to be performed. Um, and they need to be carried out when the wind is in different directions and at different velocities and different meteorological conditions. It only makes sense. However, there's a limitation to the flux sense in that you can only use it during ideal meteorological conditions. So it's a paradox. What do you do? Um, you either have to bring in some other technology do the measurements and see if they jive with what the ideal meteorological conditions are reporting. And then you can make an assumption whether there's no seasonal variability or day night variability or or wind velocity variability throughout the day. Right. Um, so these are some of the limitations. Uh, if a refinery is surrounded by other sources, um, could be near road, could be other refineries, could be other facilities. Um, you may not be able to use this technology. It just isn't clear cut enough. If you have a refinery standing out in the middle of a field in Colorado with nothing else around it and it's flat terrain, okay, this, this might be more accurate. It might be a good way to measure the flux measurements, but we feel that you should also do other orthogonal empirical testing to confirm that the solar occultation flux technology works. Um, you can only do it during sunny days in cloud-free conditions. And you should measure upwind and downwind simultaneously, because if you're using that upwind as your background and subtracting that from all your measurements downstream, um, you better be pretty sure that the same meteorological conditions, wind velocities and everything else are the same, right? Um, plume death and height and mixing needs to be done with multiple LIDAR instruments in order to get the best accuracy and an integrated measurement of flux conditions. And uh, they need to open up their IP, their models, their black boxes to 
uh, other scientists and engineers that can plug in the numbers themselves and try to figure out where possible bias may exist. Doesn't mean that it's there and might not be there, and these are the new emission factors. But it's a little hard to swallow when no one else has been able to come up with this actual emissions. Uh, and there's been a lot of work that's been done with other types of technologies. Um, so again, we talked about the uncertainty, but not the bias was being addressed. And if you look at the estimated uncertainty, right now, this is from FluxSense themselves, right? These are all the uncertainties that are systematic and random, all right? Because they replied to our first presentation, which called all of this out, saying it needs to be looked at in order to say that these numbers are correct. And you can see that this uncertainty still doesn't account for the four to 10 times higher emissions than published emission factors. So you can't explain it with the uncertainty, even though that's a lot of uncertainty. Um, how do you go about figuring out what's going on? Well, if we looked at that tanks model again versus the solar occultation field measurements that were done on that tank field, now this is perfect ideal meteorological conditions, terrain, upwind, downwind, very close to the measurement sources. If you take a look at that last column, the total difference between measurement days in the year, you can see um, that this uncertainty expands and the uncertainty now anywhere from, what is that, 34% to 90.2%, right? That's during ideal conditions, right? So we feel that that can easily be doubled um, with some bias measurements. Um, and uh, in fact, I don't know if we were actually, we can believe about two to two and a half times higher emissions and published emission factors. And this is just not me, this is four other organizations, atmospheric chemists looking at the same data and coming up with the same conclusions. All right, so four to 10 times higher, just it just doesn't, doesn't ring true. Um, two to two and a half times that we can see, it's possible, but there needs to be more empirical data generated in order to accept that. Um, and so we're gonna see what Europe starts doing with their data now that they have a draft method for solar occultation flux. And we're gonna look at the tracer studies that are going to be performed. And if you can do enough tracer studies, that will, that'll pretty much give you much more confidence in the published data. Um, but until that's done, we're still gonna have to take all of this with a grain of salt. And uh, regulatory agencies should not be using this to issue notices of violation or for determining whether a source is a major or minor source and whether or not any uh, uh, community group um, uh, suits or, or legal suits um, come about. Um, because this data will not stand up right now to the scrutiny in a court of law. And uh, until additional work is done or orthogonal results are presented, um, this data is still suspect. Okay. Now, the last slide I have here is the potential uses and benefits of the flux sense. Uh, it does offer advantages um, for fugitive emissions. It's very good at finding hot spots, right? Great. You drive around the facility, you measure the column, anything crossing over that's elevated, it's going to let you know, it lets you know you have a, an, an issue, there's a problem in one of those source units, and you better address it. So it's great at doing that. But that's a qualitative measurement and semi-quantitative. There's a much greater issue with using this to come up with quantifiable results and then applying those quantifiable results to air permits and notices of violation, All right? Um, but other than that, um, it's interesting technology. Uh, they've done a lot of work, but we feel that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And with that, I'll take any questions.